Okay, well, welcome to our joint MQ to EOL seminar. It looks like EOL is a little bit outnumbered this morning, but uh, that's kind of fine. Our speaker is Peter Baines from the University of Melbourne. He uh, got his undergraduate degrees in physics and math with honors from Cam uh, sorry from University of Melbourne, uh, doctorate from Cambridge University in geophysical fluid sciences. Sorry, I'm having trouble talking today. Geophysical fluid dynamics. And then I had a research associate at MIT for two years before getting the Queen's Fellowship in Marine Science at CSIRO, where he stayed until 2003. And I then took a position as the honorary professor and senior fellow at the University of Melbourne. He has about 150 publications, uh, including two books. He's a member of the Royal Meteorological Society, the Royal Society of Victoria, the American Geophysical Union, and AMS. His research has been focused on planetary fluid dynamics in various fluids, from flow in submarine canyons to large-scale atmospheric circulation, from theoretical studies to lab simulations to real-world phenomena. His seminar today will address the latter, as you can see, uh, the generation of atmospheric internal waves by explosive volcanic interruptions. Please welcome Peter Baines. Thank you, Stuart. I'll just turn this, turn this thing on. Um, since I was asked to. Um, yes, well, it, it, it's very nice to be here. I've, uh, the, last, the only part of NCAR I visited was up on the Mesa, so uh, uh, I, hadn't, I wasn't aware of the sort of all the various different places and things that you've got down here. But uh, I found my way here this morning eventually, I say. Um, so uh, this talk, I have there, I'm, I'm pleading a cause uh, with this topic. Uh, uh, and uh, you'll see. Uh, which you'll, you'll see uh, the details of uh, in the next few minutes. Um, the generation of atmospheric internal waves is by explosive volcanic eruptions. Uh, the explosive, uh, it just makes the title sound a bit more exciting, but uh, what I'm talking about also applies to non-explosive eruptions. So, um, as you'll see. Um, most of the data comes from uh, an explosive volcano, which is uh, on the island of Montserrat. Uh, and the sort of record that you get from microbarographs uh, on the island uh, within a few kilometers of the source, uh, these are actually five kilometers away, um, uh, for uh, eruptions, uh, there's four eruptions here, 30th, 14th, 15th of July 2003, and January 2009. Uh, the scale here is Pascal, so you need a microbarograph to see them, but this is just measurements of surface pressure. This, um, where this came, comes from, is from a team of geophysicists who have put instruments uh, around, around, around this volcano uh, in Montserrat with the idea of understanding the plumbing underneath it, uh, because uh, it's been going through a regular series of eruptions, so you can rely uh, uh, but, uh, and, and these guys make um, gadgets which measure displacements, which they bury about 300 meters down in the ground. And they can measure displacements which are uh, fractions of a micron. Okay. So, um, but they're so sensitive that they also see the atmospheric pressure. So uh, in order to remove the atmospheric pressure, you need a microbarograph up on the surface above the instrument. And that's where these records have come from. So uh, these, the arrows show the time of the eruption, and and uh, it follows. There's this there's this uh, pattern here, which where the main the large scale features are internal waves, which have periods of uh, say about eight, nine, ten minutes. So. So this is this is uh, Montserrat. It's out. It's here. Uh, the uh, volcano is here. You, you, anyone here had anything to do with this? Um, hold on. I, I, anything to do with these uh, with this this particular island or eruption? Okay. Um, so the, the volcano is here, um, and the um, and the stations where they have observations are made are, are up in here. Uh, these records here are from AIRS, which is, uh, stands for Air Studio, which is where the Beatles made most of their recordings, isn't it? Um, so, 
So um, the question is, what, what, how do these waves relate to the nature and the magnitude of the eruption? Uh, and the whole purpose of this exercise is to, if you have these observations, what do they actually tell you? Uh, and and the, the, the cause that I'm pleading is that if, if you have these, uh, have these observations and you can interpret what they mean, they can give you information about a volcanic eruption which may not be available from anything else. Places on Iceland, for example, where, um, <coughs> uh, I mean, the eruption might be at night or in cloud, or well, there may be no other observations. Uh, if you could make these remote uh, uh, observations and interpret them, you, get, you can get early warning about just exactly what happened, or at least a good idea of what happened. <coughs> now, Not necessarily, no. The explosive ones uh, happen fairly quickly, as you'll see. But, uh, but others, uh, but if you have something which is, um, say, may something start and then stay on for a long period of time, you get a totally different kind of signal. So uh, we have um, my colleague, this is a geophysicist called Selwyn Sachs, who was the person who invented these um, micro uh, uh, strain gauges. Um, and we have a, a paper uh, which is published in a um, published in a volume about Montserrat uh, by the London uh, uh, Geological Society. Um, but uh, the methodology which is described in there, I think, is is not the optimum. Uh, and, and what I think is the optimum is what I'm talking about here. I've got a question. Yep. So, uh, with respect to uh, uh, immediate information, uh, what's the speed of uh, seismic? Oh, yep, they, they can indeed, yeah. Uh, well, seismic waves will tell you what's happening in, in the ground and under the ground. They don't tell you what's happening in the atmosphere, which is what, what these, these things mean. OK, well, I said a series of these eruptions began 20 years ago. And, and it continues now. And uh, as a result of all this, the southern half of the island, which is this region down here, uh, is inaccessible. Uh, although uh, the, uh, the locals um, are complaining that they are, the, the, the number of uh, uh, eruptions has, has decreased, uh, and they, they are claiming that they should be allowed back in. But, um, but it's actually a very dangerous volcano because it emits a lot of sulfur. Um, this is the capital city of Montserrat, uh, or town, um, which is on the south, um, that's down here. So in, in 1997, it all got covered with ash, uh, and uh, it's not particularly habitable these days. So I'd just like to just uh, give a number of other er, examples of other eruptions. This is some... Um, this is one in Alaska, which is um, taken from a satellite, I believe. Um, and it's what you call a Plinian eruption, where everything for us goes straight up, and this is starting to spread at an upper level. Uh, it's another Plinian eruption. Uh, Coignabrite eruption in Alaska. And back to Montserrat. This is another eruption part of the current series. So, uh, and the Montserrat ones are, uh, as I said, they're explosive. Here's an example which was taken on a schedule, from a scheduled flight uh, in the Caribbean. Um, this whole thing developed in a time scale of about two minutes. And just a little bit later, it looked like that, taken from the same plane. So, so that's what we're talking about. Um, the, um, the, the, the other interesting location uh, where observations with the strain gauges have been made is Iceland. Uh, and and, and uh, there the, the eruptions are, are of a different kind. The, uh, the, 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 uh, 
the lava or material from Montserrat is actually very viscous, uh, whereas the stuff in, uh, from Iceland isn't. But nonetheless, um, the methodology which I'm talking about is applicable to both of them. Now, the best models of uh, eruptions of, uh, 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 are based, have been described by Andy Woods uh, in his PhD thesis. Uh, and uh, the parameters that you've got if you want, you're talking about a fluid dynamical model of, a, of an eruption that's, um, that has um, a whole lot of solid material uh, ejected, uh, as well as uh, buoyant, just buoyant fluid. So the parameters we've got is the, are the radius of the source, uh, the velocity of the ejection, the temperature of what's coming out, and the uh, mass fraction that's gas or solid material. Uh, that's being emitted. And the fraction of this hot particulate material can have a big impact on the nature of the eruption that you have. So this is, um, this is from Andy Woods' paper. Um, so this, this shows four different situations for depending on the size of the vent, whether it's uh, the radius is 20, 50, 100, or 150, or 200 uh, meters. Okay, so that's not that big. Uh, the vertical velocity is assumed to be 300 meters a second. The temperature is 1,000 K, and the gas mass fraction is 0.03. In other words, 97% of what's being emitted is hot solid material of a temperature of 1,000 K. So. The radius of the plume sort of increases. Uh, the interesting feature is that the vertical velocity initially decreases because all this hot, this solid material comes out and, and the weight of it slows, slows it down. Uh, but as the, the heat gets converted from the, uh, or transferred from the solid material to the, uh, to the environment, because it's in training uh, environmental air as it, as it rises, becomes buoyant and then takes off and reaching up to, in this case, 30 kilometers. So that's the sort of animal we're talking about. Um, this shows some other plots from the same model with uh, showing the vertical velocity. So initially, for a range of values of the vertical velocity, from 100 to 1,000 meters per second, uh, Sorry, uh, that's this is sorry, this, the, the, what the, the main difference in these curves here is, is the temperature of what's being emitted. This is 900k for this curve, and 1800k for this curve, and we've got a whole range of curves in between. So, um, so you can see here, uh, there's this turnaround here, and reaching a range of different heights. So this is. Um, oh, what, <coughs> sorry, what's, uh, what's the difference between these two? Well, this, this one is 0.03 for N naught. The gas mass fraction is, is uh, 3 per gas is 3% of the mass. Um, and for this one, it's 0.5% of the mass. So that's the main, main difference. And here you can see these curves come along here, swing back and still get up to here, even though they've uh, they, they're in danger here of not getting off the ground. Sometimes, if, if the particles are too big and heavy, then this doesn't get very far at all. So, for these guys, it turns out, though, that the general picture that you get is much the same as what you get from the Morton, Taylor, and Turner um, plume models. Uh, you've got, uh, as this rises, you've got uh, inflow uh, from the environmental atmosphere up until some point where it reaches, it reaches its equilibrium level and overshoots and comes back and then spreads out. And if you ask the question, what's the effect that this is going to have on the local atmosphere? To me, the most appropriate way is to put a cylinder around this, imaginary cylinder, around this eruption, 
and use the internal dynamics from the plume or whatever model you use to determine uh, the horizontal flow on the surface of this cylinder. Question? Yep. Then you're going to mention this, but what's the magnitude of that inflow? Um, well, yes, we'll get, uh, it's, uh, the, the, it's, it's um, about 10% of the vertical velocity in the plume. That's, that's, a, that's a remarkably robust number, actually. Even, even people who, who look at turbulence in wind tunnels and mobile wings do all the rest of it, that, that if you have turbulent uh, go, fluid going past, the entrainment of, its, of the stationary, relatively stationary environment is about 0 .09, 0 0.095, 0 0.1. Some, some sort of number is a sort of generic property of turbulence. Even though the mixture, the process of entrainment is really remarkably complicated. So here it is here. So you've got, um, so typically you've got rising, rising motion here. Uh, the, um, the, the velocity is largest here and it, it decreases as it, as it, as you, as it goes up uh, and, and it overshoots and then you've got a spreading region here where the, the flow which is spreading is equal to the, the, the mass that's come up here plus the mass that's been entrained on the way. And the rising velocity is largest here, so the entrainment is largest here. But as you go up, the radius is increasing. So the net effect of that tends to, tends, tends to be that the, the actual inflow is still quite substantial. And you wind up, if, if you want to put a, your cylinder around all this, on the boundary of the cylinder, you've got a profile like that. So this is just another diagram saying much the same thing. In fact, due to the increasing radius, you expect the inflow to be uh, increased as you go up. OK, now, what does the atmosphere look like? Well, uh, most of you know this quite about this. But from that current point of view, the main uh, property that we're interested in is the vertical profile of the buoyancy frequency and for Montserrat, um, it looks something like this. We have the tropophores here up about 14 kilometres. And, um, and, and, and as you pass through the, through, through the tropophores, uh, then the value of, of N approximately doubles. Uh, this is actually, this is, so this is Montserrat, sorry. Uh, this is again just showing the same information. So this is, this shows the annual cycle of the buoyancy frequencies from these, these curves here. And if we go to Iceland, which is the other place uh, that's of particular interest, um, you've got pretty much the same structure. There's a bit of variation here, but, but of course it's lower down because it's much higher latitude. But again, we've gone from um, 0.13 over here to approximately double up there in the stratosphere. Now this is important, as you'll see in a minute. So if one wants to make a, a mathematical model of what sort of uh, internal waves uh, do you expect to get if you have a volcanic eruption with a, of a particular sort, then uh, you're drawn to these equations here. Um, and uh, as big meteorologists, you'll all be well aware that uh, if you make this transformation here, where if u, v, and w are the actual velocity, uh, and you uh, scale that with, with the square root of the density profile, which is this guy over here, where h is for mean density profile, where h is the scale height, uh, for, and, uh, for, to give you variables capital U, capital V, capital W, and the other way around for the pressure, you can write down these equations here with constant coefficients for the most part um, of vertical velocity w or uh, scaled uh, in terms of uh, n squared and uh, gamma which is uh, variable over there. And you can use this to to produce an equation for, in this case, vertical velocity, pressure equation is very similar, 
uh, where you have forcing terms over here, which uh, where uh, f, uh, f, f, e, f e is, is a, a effectively a source, local, a source term of, of thermal energy, and f m is a source term for mass. Uh, and, and these equations have been used by geophysicists to uh, determine the properties of, of nuclear eruptions, nuclear explosions, I think about, uh, in the atmosphere. So high up in the atmosphere, you have a bomb goes off, generates a source of mass and energy, uh, the bomb produces the energy. Uh, this equation has been used to determine what kind of waves that you get. So sound waves in particular are described by these equations. Um, no, it's it's actually the, the thermal energy. It's the amount of heat that you're yes, putting. Yes, yes, yes. Yep, the, th the thermal energy, whereas FM is the mass. So um, now I've we used this model. Uh, it was um, preferred by my co-author uh, and the geologists. And, and the paper that I mentioned uh, in the um, in the Montserrat volume uses this model uh, to uh, uh, to. Uh, but with a vertical profile of this forcing. Um, and the, um, the geologists liked it, um, but I don't particularly, although I <laughs> wrote the paper. Um, so I'm, I'm here plugging what I believe is a much more appropriate model. Um, and in this case, we take the same equations. There's no forcing term over here. And uh, this, I've worked with working with pressure instead of velocity. Uh, that's not that's not the big difference. I mean, the previous one was done with pressure. Uh, and here, if you if you lop out the, uh, you say, well, speed of sound. We're talking about internal waves, and, and these terms are small, so you do with it, with that that that. And well, you could keep that if you wanted to, and you keep this one. Uh, they're only constants, but their effects are small. So you come, but if you remove them, uh, you come down to this very familiar equation for internal waves, which I'm sure. Nice to see. No, no, no. Well, land waves are potentially yes. That's a, that's a that's a sound type wave. Yep. But that's not what we're trying to describe. We're trying to describe internal waves. It can can generate land. Yes, they certainly generate sound waves. But that's. Um, uh, I, I'm talking about I'm talking about in, internal waves. I don't think uh, I, I don't know that this, um, interpreting the sound waves to describe the source. I think is a, would be a real challenge. It all happens so quickly that uh, that. Um, so the surface boundary condition is this. Uh, so we have this this very familiar equation here, or internal waves. So this is this is what we've got. We've got uh, we're assuming there's no wind. Uh, this is our boundary condition on a radial. This this is our line where we have describing conditions on the cylinder surrounding the eruption, which is off here to the left somewhere. Uh, and this distance is an arbitrary distance away from the centre of it, uh, and uh, radius is say two or three kilometres for argument's sake. Uh, and and we've got some forcing here, which will look a bit like this. Uh, because of the nature of the eruption, the, the entrainment at the lower levels, and the outflow at the upper levels, and we're generating waves which are going to propagate along uh, in the troposphere, measuring, measuring what's uh, happening the uh, instruments on the ground. Now, this complication in that the tropopause is not a rigid fit, uh, so we have uh, these differences in the buoyancy frequency. So if we have an internal wave, up here, uh, which is propagating upwards, and it's incident on the tropopause. Part of the energy gets reflected back down again, and part of it gets through and continues on up there. And if you do the sums to to work out what uh, how much gets reflected and how much gets transmitted uh, as the ratio of the uh, of the two buoyancy frequencies is N1 is the buoyancy frequency in the troposphere and N2 is in the stratosphere, uh, then 
the, the, these are the this, this is the this is the transmission the, the size this is this isn't actually the energy but it's the amplitude the relative amplitude of the wave up here to the wave that's there and we're going from zero to one uh, and um, it's very small if you're over here it's practically one over here with the same and we know that the ratio of these two is approximately 0.5 at least this is half that so we're generally speaking we're on here this line here as a function of frequency so uh, we're in the range of about um, 0.5 to or, or less getting through okay so that has to be considered when you do the sums Now, these equations can be solved by Laplace transform, uh, allowing for whatever time-dependent structure the eruption might have. And you can get solutions in terms of the sinusoids in the verticals, the Fourier series, and ankle functions of the uh, radial variable. And uh, I won't bore you with the details of the computations, uh, but just show some uh, typical results. So if we assume so, um, that, that the forcing from the eruption has the shape of this blue curve, right? This is the horizontal velocity on some imaginary cylinder surrounding the, uh, the eruption. It's radial. Um, uh, and you see you've got sort of entrainment, represents entrainment here and outflow there. This is the actual velocity. If you convert this to, to by, by multiplying this curve by the square root of the, uh, of, the, of the vertical mean density profile, you come down to this curve down here, which is the sinusoid. Okay? So obviously, I start with the sinusoid here. That gives you this curve. As it, as it happens, this curve really looks, uh, is a reasonably close, uh, 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 not, well, it's just a rough fit to the sort of profile you get from, uh, from the plume model of the eruption. So with this being sinusoid, then that's, that, that's, um, that you do, that's uh, the simplest form of forcing. And in any case, if you have an eruption, the projection of this onto a Fourier series, the, the lowest mode is the one which travels fastest and is quite likely to have the largest amplitude. <coughs> so I'm going to show you a couple of the results for a couple of profiles. It's this guy, where this goes all the way up to the tropopause. And just for argument's sake, the same profile uh, and just to putting the whole thing up in up in the stratosphere with nothing down here. And this is unrealistic, but at least it shows you what happens if you put the put that up there. And again, if you convert this uh, to um, to capital U, or to physical U, to the capital U, uh, you can get a sinusoid here. So this is the um, this is what you get profile A. That's this guy here. Okay. So these are curves. Time, this is time going this way, scaled with n one, the buoyancy frequency, uh, at distance um, uh, where the radius, uh, the, the distance is 1.45. If this distance is uh, one to here. Uh, well, this is 1.45, 2.8, and 5.05, and and what um, what this is showing is there's a this is this is I should have said sorry this is this is allowing a a two minute build up to get to the uh, to get to the maximum uh, go back to this it's taking this profile building it up linearly with time okay reaching its constant value uh, after two minutes and then it stays there for it then stays there for two minutes and then suddenly decays in one second sudden, a sudden turn off if you like and that and this is the result so um, the pressure at each of these locations this is one like this it's different distances 1.45 2.8 and 5.05 so uh, there's initial uh, decrease, very sudden decrease, which is uh, it's not actually plotted here, but we start out with nothing. Uh, it, it goes down to these levels here, uh, and then so there's a large negative component, in other words, and then it's followed by a large positive one, and then and then a decay. 
And I put again these curves over here just to show that, that generally speaking, it's, it's, that's the sort of structure that you observe. Do you have a? Is a question on that? No, but your low pressure there means that the tropopause is actually um, going down at that point, right? That's the first thing that happens at the stadium. Uh, you're going like this. Uh, if you're hitting the atmosphere like this, it reduces the pressure at the bottom. Okay, we only this is this is just. I'm showing surface surface pressure. Yes. All of this is pressure on on, on, yes, no, on at, gra at, gra at ground level. But yep. it's mainly because the trouble force is walking around. Uh, well, it's not it's not the trouble force so much. It's uh, the, the trouble force is um, uh, is a bit incidental. Uh, it reflects uh, a fair amount of stuff. Uh, if you didn't have it at all, these waves would decay much more quickly, but you would still get this initial decrease. So if you go like that, if you if you look at an internal wave, at the point where the situation like that, you've got minimum pressure at the ground. So so that's. So just to. Uh, just to recap, uh, there's just some simple properties of internal waves. If we just assume that we have an internal wave, which is sort of sinusoidal, uh, the dispersion relation is this uh, uh, frequency, is this the buoyancy frequency. The speed is uh, frequency divided by wave number. And if you've got the speed of the speed of the wave in terms of nd over pi, which is the, the fastest speed that these things can have, then the curve is a function of wave number. It goes like this. And um, just looking at where we're at, for these these waves, we ran about in this region of this curve here. But these curves, these curves are made up of a, by integrating over a whole range of you know the whole frequency spectrum from zero to to n, okay, for for the waves. So that they're not just they're not just single frequencies, although they have they have a dominant frequency in them. There's actually information uh, in what that is. And then if we go back to look at the one, we go back to this one, where we put a disturbance up in the stratosphere with nothing in the troposphere at all, on the same basis, what you get is this. So these are this is the curve which is one, uh, these are all at distance r, okay, and this blue curve is one point. 1.95, so that's reasonably close. That's the one that's closest to the source. Um, so there's really, um, and then these other guys come in uh, much later. The actual amplitude here is much smaller, as you might expect, because the wave has to go down, has to get get through the through the tropopause, because as it goes down, some of the friction gets energy gets reflected back. Uh, what gets down there uh, hits the ground much further further away from the source. Um, and has smaller amplitude. So the signal, so so if something gets into the stratosphere, um, well, if you just have the sort of the, the entrainment part in the troposphere, and and all this big outflow up in the stratosphere, then um, then you you expect to get a much smaller signal overall. But at least you get some. Well, it's only a different signal. Uh, this shows the variations that you get depending on the height of the eruption if it stays within uh, the troposphere. This one, these are the curves which I've just showed you before. Um, if, if the height of the eruption is uh, instead of 14 kilometers, it just goes up to 10 kilometers, uh, then, then you get a rather similar pattern, but but it's delayed. And, and up here, if it's only halfway up the uh, troposphere, it's delayed even more. So there's information in there. If you have an eruption which you just turn it on, and then it stays steady, like a, say a Plinian eruption goes bang, and just keeps on going continuously, uh, then you, what you get is this big negative signal uh, and then pretty much nothing else. So, 
Yep. Lower pressure, get back to the young's question. Is that must be doing subsidence and warming on the explosion, so there's this upward motion. Which is simulating the effect of the upward motion by having an end and down. Yep. So immediately it must be a down. Not necessarily. It goes up and stays up there because it, it spreads out as it, at its neutral density level. So even though it's even if it's loaded with material, that slowly falls out much later on. Lower pressure if I integrate the hydrostatic Sorry, I, mean, uh, I would think that the lower pressure away from the uh, blast, that signal away from the blast, is losing. Well, well, the, 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 this the, the, that's not what's happening here. This is um, this is this is due to the fact that you, you you've got the, 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 this entrain the entrainment is a remarkably powerful process. Okay, uh, you've got uh, even though it's not all that obvious. The um, I, I have a movie here uh, from which is taken of uh, the um, uh, IFI yokel eruption. By, uh, I can show you later on. I haven't actually looked at it myself uh, in a lot of detail, but but you can but but it, it, there's turbulence. That, that the Icelanders could walk quite close to this. They're entitled to walk quite close to the eruption because they're locals and want nothing to stop them. Uh, and they filmed the details of it, and you can see all this vigorous turbulence going on. And, and it wasn't obvious to them that uh, they said, that, you know, this, there's no entrapment going on here. You can see all this stuff. It just stays the same. It's going around and around and around and like that. Uh, but but if you look down at ground level where there was a bit of snow getting drawn into you, it's a massive. But so so it's a very remarkably powerful process in training. This, this model is, is an internal wave model. This is the internal wave model, and 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 this this is driven by the entrainment uh, at at um, at lower levels. This is again this is going up to this 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 guy goes right up to the. Uh, top. Uh, by um, yes, it's a property of internal waves. Yep, that's exactly right. Do you, 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 it, you, yeah, the, yeah. That's that. That's a good way of putting. So th this, 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 this is this comes out of the same equations which I showed you before. Okay, it's not. Uh, there's no. There's no overlying stuff. And, and the spreading, as I said, it, it's at, uh, at spreading it up a level. I mean, it's the push that's really driving it. Uh, you, but, um, I don't think the actual weight does a great deal, does much. So it's, it's worth worth looking. So I, must, so I agree. The, so the fluid parcel displacing something down and not that much of a factor in the way, say, the net temperature change in the column. Uh, it's going. It's uh, it's an internal wave. It's put it in internal wave. <laughs> okay, well that's basically it. Um. So uh, I claim that this, this, this kind of model, I think, is, is the best way to determine the internal wave response to, uh, to these uh, eruptions. And they don't have to be explosive ones like most of them are on Montserrat. Uh, these, uh, it works perfectly well for non-explosive eruptions like the sort that you're likely to get in Iceland. Strongest signals are generated by eruptions that are alive within the troposphere. Um, and these give waves which are consistent with what's observed. The, um, there, there's, so far, there's firstly no data in Iceland. They, um, although uh, there's no data with these microbarographs. Um, what is interesting is that the, um, these guys at uh, Carnegie uh, had put these strain gauges deep in the ground around, uh, around Hekla uh, in, um, in Iceland, and uh, they uh, they knew enough about it to, to fork, at least has this extreme likelihood that there'd be an eruption in the next uh, few hours. And they passed this on to the local weather bureau in Iceland, who had the temerity to issue a forecast, and the airlines re-diverted their flights, and an hour and a half later, the, the eruption occurred. 
So, so that's, um, that's about the only time I think that's happened. Um, but they did, they did that with their, their, strain, their deep strain gauges, not with surface microbarographs. They did uh, ask the Icelanders uh, to, um, to put out microbarographs, uh, but they only recorded them every 30 minutes. <laughs> so uh, <that> was <laughs> I think now I think they've got a few more out there. Uh, and uh, they've also got some of them around uh, in um, a volcano in Italy. They actually made these strain gauges in uh, in, in Washington, uh, and the um, but there's a Japanese. They've made some 100. They've made 180 of them or something. But the Japanese have uh, they've, they've sold the rights to a Japanese company who are making them over there, for, at least for Japan. Okay, uh, plumes that reach the stratosphere uh, give weaker signals, or at least it's different. It's uh, uh, without sort of describing all possible options. Um, the, the ones that reach uh, smaller heights um, uh, have later arrival times. And the main point of all this is that I think that uh, we're, we're using, uh, if we uh, understand these, these things well enough, these ways can actually give quantitative information which could be quite useful uh, for uh, in fairly, you know, fairly, 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 fairly immediate, within, uh, at least within an hour or so, of what actually happened, even if you don't have any other observations. And uh, I know my, my friends at Carnegie are very keen to try and publicize this as a really interesting you know, or potential, potentially useful and valuable um, thing to pursue. Thank you. OK, thank you, Peter. Uh, do we have any questions? Further questions, maybe I should say. Peter, in this case of a continuous eruption, um, you show that the pressure signal flattens out, so mm -hmm. there's hardly anything. Can you can you give us a little bit more insight as to why um, um, is the cancellation of, of different? Well, you, you've got you just give it a uh, push and, and nothing else. That's basically what it does. It it it, it, it actually it pushes and it, it's it. It keeps on pushing, but doesn't change. So if if, if there's no change, you, there's no wave generation. All the waves propagate out. You, you get you get you get something from the initial disturbance. It's only the time dependence of the eruption that, that generates waves. Yeah. If, anything steady. Uh, no, is it not the cancellation of the wave component? No, no, it's it. it, it, it Yes, this, this, this wave propagates out, and uh, it, as it goes, it's decreasing because it's, le it's leaking, leaking energy upwards and spreading out radially. So that, that's the reason for this decrease as it goes. So the, these are just different locations. More questions? Uh, I just wonder, are there any, or were there any attempt to measure uh, use LIDAR or radar to measure this type of event to trying to evaluate the, the, the eruption it's a, it's a continuous or not, not to my knowledge there's been a lot of work has been done on Montserrat but it's mainly mainly the geologists geophysicists um, not much uh, has been done looking at what's actually happening in the atmosphere so there, quite often you, you put out your instruments and you wait uh, and, and the virtue of, virtue of Montserrat is uh, is that it's it's been going through this uh, cycle, uh, quite a lot of activity, but it's now starting to taper off. I have a question uh, regarding the uh, signal for the higher plumes that go into the stratosphere. Yep. Uh, you said that the uh, um, internal wave generation of the signal is weaker. Um, I understand because of the, the reflection of, at the triple pass, but mm. at the same time, the eruptions that make it into the stratosphere, they have more energy, a higher temperature, more mass, so exactly. I would expect a, a stronger yes. signal simply from that effect. From that, from that point of view, you certainly would, yes. So, um, but but it'll be a different different character. I mean, I haven't explored uh, uh, all the, all the possible options that you get. That's, that's something one can do with this model. Um, but um, yep. 
So, but if, 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 if it gets into the stratosphere, it means that in the, in the troposphere, you're just going to get inflow. Uh, and then in the stratosphere, you get outflow. And, and, um, and, and that's generally going to give you a, a smaller signal close up uh, and then a different signal further away. Uh, I wouldn't like to speculate just exactly what it's going to look like. Any further questions? Yep. Yes, uh, I'm surprised that you said that the entrainment coefficient for for this was basically the same as uh, Morton Taylor Turner for plumes, mm. because for an instantaneous source <clears throat> such as a detonation, uh, what you find from their experiments, entrainment coefficients order of 0.3. Uh -huh. Whereas if you look at a nuclear detonation, it's down, it's, it's half to maybe two-thirds that value. And the whole idea is that you've got this, in this, in that case, very light fluid, and, and the air just does not penetrate that wall. Mm -hmm. In your case, where it's solid, I mean, 97%, I, I'm surprised that, that you would get the same sort of entrainment here as you would in, you know, con lab experiments, uh, as you said, alpha's mm. order of 0.1, something like that. Mm -hmm. I would think it'd be less. You think it'd be less? I, I, would, I would think, I don't see how you, uh, it seemed to me that, that that would create some blockage that you would need the same type of mixing. That would, that would but but the process that you've got at the edge of this is sort of engulfment with these sort of quite large-ish eddies, yeah. which um, you know, sort of uh, actually are, are sort of in training or uh, is sort of involving the you know the environmental fluid. That um, and these velocities are the velocities in these things aren't enormous. I mean, it's not um, it's not like um, you know, nuclear detonations or anything. Um, right, but your but your velocities at the surface look like I mean, they showed early on. I thought they were order of hundred. I'm not sure what the units were. Three hundred meters. Yeah. Yeah, oh, that's, that's, well, that, to me, that's huge. Oh, yes, but that drops down very quickly, though. I know there's uh, no order yeah. Uh, yeah. 10 or more. Right? Yeah, well, what, it's, yeah, that, 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 you're quite, that might all well be different. I mean, I, I, I don't want to make a big issue of it, but I, I'm just, uh, that, that's, um, that, that's what uh, uh, Woods' model assumes the same constant attainment coefficients. Yeah. Uh, but although, admittedly, his bottom bit, he, his, his model actually has a bit of um, sort of inertial. Uh, 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 a bit at the start, which, but that certainly covers a hundred meters or so. Uh, where uh, it's. I, I take it, does, does he have any uh, experimental confirmation of those numbers? Uh, <laughs> from real volcanoes. <laughs> oh, Anything that would simulate a real volcano? I think once you get above. Good question. How do you test it uh, for, for real volcano? So it hasn't been tested for real volcano. But but uh, but I've uh, you know, the um, the guys uh, at mechanical engineering down uh, you know they assure me that you know this, they, they they're doing all these experiments with wind high quality work with wind tunnels, trying to measure drag coefficients over surfaces and things like that. And uh, you know, um, they they're quite happy that uh, you know, point one is uh, pretty good. For, most general situations. So, Peter, uh, how important here is the diabetic heating from the particular matter uh, in the plume? Uh, and, well, that's, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's the first question. It's, it's very important. Now, if we, okay. if we go back to. Um, yep, this sort of situation. Now, this comes out of the model, uh, but, uh, but you've got. Uh, these, this starts out, uh, the temperature is, um, uh, well, it's a range of values. Uh, yeah, where are we? Sorry, this is, um, no, th this is, we've got, I think, I think this starts out up at 1700 to start with. I mean, th this, is, uh, this is just artificial numbers, but 700K. Um, and, um, and, and we're looking at a range of Ws uh, with initial velocities. This is 100 meters a second, and these guys over here are 1,000 meters per second. Okay. So, um, and you can see initially that the, 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 this is, we're plotting here vertical velocity. Vertical velocity decreases enormously 
quickly in the bottom, uh, you know, just a bit of this diagram. I thought, I'm not sure, I thought maybe your question was directed at his internal heating from reaction burning of the, of the solid mass. Is that something I was interested in? Does that play a role in this at all? Well, this, the, the model assumes that uh, the solid mass is, it comes out and it's giving up its heat to, uh, to the environment. So, but, uh, it, it, it's, it's the entrainment, which is it, it's the entra entrained air is, is is absorbing the heat, uh, and that's what's causing this turnaround. It's unreactive. Pardon? It's unreactive. There's no reaction going on. And is the um, uh, the virtual effect or whatever you want to call it the change in buoyancy due to the uh, stuff that's sinking down in it? continuously, so that's included also. Sorry, say that again. So you have the mass of the particulate matter yes. within the plume, Yes. and that is, um, you know, there's drag from it. Yes, but that's that's hot, okay. Uh, the mass and, and the gas coming out will have the same temperature, which is, um, in this case, uh, 1700. I think that's, um, I think that's what that's, let's say, oh, it starts out so hang on, maybe, maybe. Well, anyway, whatever, whatever it is, when it comes out, it, that all has the same temperature. But it, the, um, but it, it's the fact that the entrained air is uh, is, is acquiring this heat, uh, which is uh, causing this uh, causing this, this uplift here. Initially, it just comes out ejected at whatever the initial velocity is, but then quickly decreases uh, until the heat gets communicated. Yep. I, I guess the, the question was uh, change in buoyancy simply because of settling of mass of solids. Yes. If solids fall down, your buoyancy Well, increases. some of them can fall down, but they, these are all assumed to stay in there okay. in, in this picture. Uh, it, it, I mean, if, uh, it, it quite often, it, it, with, uh, on Montserrat, quite often you have big boulders and stuff sort of dropping out and bouncing around the mountain. Um, but that, that's not, not you know, th 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 they're, they're not part of the picture here. They're assumed that the, what comes out is, uh, is, is particulate, but it, it's small enough to stay in the plume and get carried up. Obviously, it falls out eventually somewhere else. Any further questions? Well, let's thank Peter again then. Thank you. Thank you for coming, folks. <laughs>